Okay. So do you guys now see a, a completely blue screen that says chapter 15? Yep. Okay, good. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the equilibrium of other types of reactions. We're going to be looking primarily at precipitation and uh, dissolutions, uh, Lewis acid and bases, and then multiple equilibrium. It's going to be very short, short, sweet, but a lot of calculations like normal. Okay. So when we talk about precipitation, you guys are familiar with precipitation means, right? Right. So when we get two solutions coming together to make a precipitation. Okay. So, or a dissolution is basically when you, you get a precipitate and then you're dissolving it. Okay, so so when we when we look at this, we're gonna have to take a look at what we call solubility, right? You guys remember we talked a little bit about solubility, like when you get two things together, uh, certain things are gonna be soluble, certain things are not gonna be soluble. Soluble basically means that you're able to either a dissolve it in solution. That means you're able to get that dissociation that's going to be occurring. Okay. Um, typically, the solubility of a substance can be expressed mathematically, uh, and it also can be expressed in terms of an equilibrium concept, uh, an equilibrium equation. So it's going to be similar to what we've seen previously, right? So the whole concept of what we've done with equilibrium is gonna still apply under these circumstances. The only thing that's gonna be different is that when you're talking about something that's from the solid, you know that the solid isn't gonna be taken into consideration in terms of that equilibrium expression, right? Because we don't take solids, we don't take liquids into consideration, okay? But we take aqueous solutions and gases, okay? And then, so, if we have this chemical equation, so here we have this dissolution where we have lead bromide being broken down into the lead ion and the bromide ion. You guys remember when we did, uh, what is it called? The, uh, the, the total, ionic. remember the total ionic equations? Yeah, yep. and that ionic equation. So this is where you're actually going to be applying this, right? Okay, so the equilibrium constant for the solubility product, or we call it KSP for solubility, um, or solubility product, um, is going to be the concentration of the lead ion and the bromide ion, okay? And that's it. And we know that it's not going to be... Uh, it's not gonna be, and I'm just drawing on my other screen, it's not gonna be the lead bromide because it's a solid, okay? <clears throat> so in this case, the KSP for lead to bromide is going to be 6.60 times 10 to the negative six, okay? Now, since the KSP here is so low, right? What is that telling us? So that it favors the reactants. So if it's favoring the reactant, that basically means that this guy is going to have low solubility, meaning that it's going to stay together more. Does that make sense? So by looking at the KSP, we can sit there and determine the solubility of things, right? Yeah, so anything that, okay, so let's say, for instance, if we have something that's 300, right? KSP, that's 300, right? So that would mean what? That would be high solubility. So that basically means that it's favoring the products. So if it's favoring the products, then they're going to be totally separate. So what I mean by low, low is typically like 10 to the fourth, 10 to the minus four, right? 
So that would kind of give us low. 10 to the minus three is, you know, kind of pushing it. That's kind of a medium, right? 10 to the minus six, definitely low, right? But that's a, actually a good question, okay? So here it says calculate the uh, KSP, right? So that's what we're doing, KSP calculations. So the KSP can be calculated directly from the um, equilibrium concentration of the dissolved ions. So at equilibrium, magnesium hydroxide is this, okay? So we have magnesium hydroxide breaking down to the magnesium ion and the hydroxide ion. Write the um, equilibrium equation and calculate the KSP for magnesium hydroxide with a magnesium ion equilibrium uh, concentration of 1.31 times 10 to the minus four molar. Okay, so how would I go about doing that? Okay, so we're gonna just get KSP. Can you guys see that? And that's gonna be equal to the concentration, the magnesium ion, and the hydroxide ion. to the second power. You can't see it? I'm sorry. Are you able to see that? Okay, so we'll use that. I keep forgetting your color blind. So in your red, blue, you know, It's a uh, solubility product. So it's the equilibrium constant for solubility product. And I'll print out these, the blue slides for you because we're gonna finish them today. So I won't even have a chance to make my own slide. So, and I'll, I'll have Marusi, will pick them up here in a second. Okay. because this is a solid. So anytime that we have a solid liquid, we only take that into consideration. We don't take, actually, we don't take that into consideration. It doesn't affect the equilibrium. Okay, two, four, six. Okay, Marusio, can you go pick these guys up for me? If I can find my keys. Uh, well, the one that has something. The one that has that one dash seven three. Oh, speaking of that. So mass mandates. We just had information on mass. So the new mass thing, it says that it is recommended, endorsed. 
So that means that you can wear the mask if you want to. You don't have to wear the mask if you don't want to. Yeah, so you can take them off if you want to. Oh, I know. Well, believe me, I know. I know. Okay. So if we know, okay, so what is it that we know for a fact? Okay, so we know the concentration of this at. So then what must be the concentration of the hydroxide ion? Two times that, okay? So then we need to put that into our equation. So we have Ksp. Equals 1.31. times 10 to the minus four molar times two times 1.31 times 10 to the minus four okay and we have to square that. You have a question, you have a look, Julia. Yes, so you, you're doubling it on the inside and squaring it on the outside. No, so this is not based upon the coefficient. That's we're calculating the coefficient. I mean, we're, cal oh, no, no, yes, yes. What well, you're asking me, it is based upon the coefficient of the chemical equation, yes. Yes, because we know that they're saying that we have enough of this to make this much. So basically it's broken down to make that much at equilibrium. And so that also lets us know because we made that much, we also have to be making this as well. Right? Again, it's been a long day for me. I've been up since, since five this morning prepping for meetings. Okay. Okay. Questions, concerns, cash. Okay. Are you guys with me? Okay, Julia. Yeah, that look. Eighty one plus it by you had the the two and the and you also squared that. I got exactly the same answer that she got. Yeah, I got 8.99 times 10 to the minus 12. Check it again. I mean, I could have made a mistake. It, it, yeah, 8.99. Yep.
It was funny. I always wondered how Mr. Vela went through his lecture so fast. And I'm like, they're like three slides. And I'm like, there's no way that you can get this all covered with three slides. Well, this one's 14. I I'm exaggerating. Yeah. But, you know, mine are like 300. And then his are like three, you know. What's that? Did you see what you did? Oh, you put an extra parenthesis there. Okay. Oh, and not the two. Yeah. Okay. So, molar solubility. So, molar solubility is just going to be the the maximum solubility in in molarity units for the substance. So, when we talk about um, the molar solubility, and it'll make reference to it in the question itself, asking for that reference. So they're really talking about the KSP, right? So that's what we're going to be looking at. Okay. So, and this is going to be done at equilibrium, right? Okay. So a specific temperature, let's see, at a specific temperature, the amount of dissolved ions at equilibrium can be calculated using the, the KSP. The equilibrium uh, and the equilibrium equation system. So if we calculate the molar solubility of lead bromide, so that's just gonna give us the moles of that lead ion, okay? So what would be the molar solubility of this compound? So in other words, we know that KSP is going to equal, remember from the equation, our equation was PB, BR2, yields, PB, 2 plus, plus 2BR minus. So we know that our equation is going to be PB, 2 plus, and BR minus square. So if we're calculating KSP, then we know that this guy is going to be, I mean, not KSP, if we're calculating our molar solubility at equilibrium, right? We know that if we use X for the concentration of the PBR, so then that'll be X times 2X squared squared. Oh my God. Who is that person? So then we get 4X cubed is going to equal KSP. So then we just plug in where SP is, and then we solve the equation. So we have equals 6.60 6 times 10 to the minus 6. OK. So Over here, 6.60 times 10 to the minus 6 over 4 is going to equal x cubed I'm going to move that so we can actually see it okay 
So then we get X is going to equal Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. Um, and you're going to be here Friday? I mean, Saturday? Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. You got to let me know how work is going. Yeah. I heard you cried because uh, the proposal, Jesse, and uh, yeah, we'll have to talk about that. Okay. I'll see you Saturday. Okay, so what did you guys get for X? One point one eight times ten to the negative two. See that looks that should be about right, yeah. I believe so, and that's molar. Okay, so then this would be the molar solubility because it's gonna be based upon the ion there, right? Or that one-to-one -one ratio, right? Whatever is in that one-to-one -one ratio. So this would be the molar solubility of the lead bromide. Does that make sense? So if they ask you for the kind of question for the molar solubility, you know that you're gonna take a look at it at equilibrium. They're gonna give you your KSP, and then you're gonna solve for the one that's gonna be one-to-one -one ratio of that, the compound ones together. Okay. Otherwise you'd have to get it so that it would be the number of moles for the compound that you have. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, let me, everybody got this down? Any questions? Abel, Maricel? Mm, not right now. Okay. It's just not to forget about the what? Yeah, they're like, poor solids, they need a little attention too. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so the common ion effect. Okay, so you guys remember Le Chatelier's principle? Yes. Okay, that's right. Okay. Okay, so, so yeah, when we are adding, let's say we're adding more product, then let's say we get more product, we know that we're going to be shifting towards the reactant. And then if we're adding more reactant, we're going to be shifting towards the product. And vice versa for removing, right? Okay, so now in, in the case of the ion, right, this is also going to be a factor as well, too, right? So the only thing is that we know that. solutions. Okay. So when we take a look at our, our net ionic equation, right? So we have our product, or let's say in this case, we have our reactant, and then we have these ions, right? So if we, if we're given an equation where we have two things coming together to make something else, right? So in other words, if we had this chemical equation, but we had, uh, let's say silver nitrate and sodium chloride, we know that the nitrate and the sodium chloride are gonna be spectators, right? And so we only are gonna be looking at what we call the net ionic equation, okay? <clears throat> And so, so for instance, if 
we're going to determine the effect of adding silver nitrate to the solution of silver chloride. So if I'm adding silver nitrate to the solution, which way is that going to drive this? It's going to favor if I had silver nitrate. That's right. Okay. Is it going to affect the silver chloride or is it going to, which way is it going to shift? So are we gonna get more silver chloride made or are we gonna get less silver chloride made? Are you sure? Are you sure? Okay, so we're having more silver. So we've added more silver. What, what's gonna happen if I add more silver? Because it's gonna push it towards the reactants, right? Okay, so if I'm adding more silver, it's gonna be pushing it towards the reactants. So it's gonna get, yeah. So it's gonna be pushing it to the right. So we're gonna have more of it in the solid state, right? If I add more chloride, what's gonna happen, all right? Same thing. So by adding those, that sodium chloride, even though the sodium doesn't play a part, Okay, so, and the effect of adding more silver chloride to our solution. Okay, so if we're adding more silver chloride, we're gonna be driving the reaction the other way. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh -huh. in the product share yeah. okay Okay, so let me make sure I'm, I'm understanding what you're asking me. So you're saying by adding the silver nitrate, well, so you got to remember that you're going to have chloride that's going to be available, but now you're adding more more silver because at equilibrium you're going to have some that exists that just doesn't go on because that's just part of solubility there's going to be a small fraction that's not going to that's going to remain soluble but most of it is going to be a solid right because that's the concept of solubility that number that we get there has to be something that is soluble right the majority of it is insoluble right it's in a solid state okay so If um, by us adding the silver nitrate, right? You're just saying I'm adding more silver. So that's gonna bind more of the chloride. It's gonna be pushing it the other way, right? So then your number in chloride is gonna drop down. You're still gonna have some, but it's gonna drop down to try to find that equilibrium again, right? And so the goal is to get that equilibrium. Okay, does that make sense or? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so let's move forward. Oops. Okay. 
Okay, so determine the concentration of ions at non-equilibrium conditions. Oh, so, sorry. Determination of precipitate information. The concentration of, non, um, of ions at non-equilibrium conditions can be used to predict the calculation, calculating Q from the equilibrium equation compared to the KSP. So if Q is gonna be greater than the SP, a precipitate will form. If Q is gonna be less than the KSP, then a precipitate won't form. And that makes sense, right? So KSP, right, that's at equilibrium. So if Q is greater, then it's favoring who? Products, right? So if it's favoring the products, oh, that doesn't make sense. Q is greater than the KSP. KSP, a precipitate will form if Q is less than the KSP then Q is less than the KSP. Okay, yeah. So if Q is greater than the KSP, KSP is at equilibrium, right? So if Q is greater than KSP, that means that we have high amounts of our, of our product, right? which means that it's going to be dry because Q is looking at a specific, let me draw it out, easiest way. Um, here's our KSP. So if Q is greater than KSP, then that means that the value of the products are higher. We have more products, right? Because our Q, so our KSP is going to be, let's use the last equation, for example. So our KSP is going to be equal to AG plus CL. Okay. Right? Okay. So if we say that our Q is greater than our KSP, is that going to be favoring our? Yes. Q is the quotient. So it's like it's KSP, it's the same equation, but at a specific point. So they're saying KSP is at equilibrium, right? That's only at equilibrium. And then Q is at looking at before equilibrium or looking at after equilibrium, right? So it's at any point throughout. So that's what Q is. Yes, because initially at starting point, you're starting at a specific point, right? And then eventually your, your solution gets to equilibrium, right? Does that make sense? And so when it's at equilibrium, everything is all perfect, right? It's always gonna be that value. That's what K is. Yeah. No, no. K is specific because it's always going to be, it's going to be equilibrium, right? That's it. It's always at equilibrium. Q could be before equilibrium. You know, it could be at any point before equilibrium, right? Okay. So we're saying as soon as you stick something into solution, you're not at equilibrium, right? It's an issue. It's the initial point. And then over time, it gets to equilibrium. Okay. So if K is greater than the value of KSP, that should be SP, not P. Sorry. That basically means that we have more products, right? 
So if we have more products, what's going to happen? That's right. We're going to be producing more reactants, right? And then if K, if Q is less than, it's going to do the opposite, right? It's going to cause more of the solid to be made into, okay, into ions. <clears throat> Okay, so, so for example, here, collected blood, it, it will coagulate due to the calcium ions presence. However, removal of the calcium ions prevent coagulation and preserves the sample from forming the calcium oxalate uh, monohydrate, okay? <clears throat> So, and then it says, calculate the mass of sodium oxalate required to prevent coagulation of a three mil blood sample with 2.20 times 10 to the minus three molar uh, calcium ions and a KSP um, for calcium oxalate of 1.8, I mean, sorry, 1.96 times 10 to the minus eight. Coagulation is, uh, what was that? Yes, like build up. So like, uh, for instance, um, a nucleation, you have heard of nucleation? So you have something that's like this initially, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So in the case of blood, what happens is, is that the blood molecules, oh, have you heard of clotting? Okay, so clotting is a result of coagulation. Blood starts to come together and it sticks together and together and gets hard to form the scab that we get, right? So that's coagulation. So when blood is coming together, sticking together, Okay, so it says calculate the mass of sodium oxalate required to prevent coagulation of three mils of blood sample. With a, okay, so, and it tells us how is that happening? So coagulation is prevented, right? So removal of calcium ion prevents coagulation, right? And preserves the sample by forming calcium oxalate. Okay, so what is the chemical formula for calcium oxalate? Okay, you said CaC2O4. Okay. Okay. Can you guys see that? Okay, I'm gonna put it up top. Oh, if I put it up top, can you guys see it? If I put it where the KSP is at, or the silver?
Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so so we want to calculate the mass of sodium oxalate required to prevent coagulation of three mils. So how would I do that? So let's calculate the mass of sodium oxalate required to prevent coagulation of a 3.00 mil blood sample with 2.20 times 10 to the minus three molar uh, calcium ions. I'm gonna to have to draw what equation? So here's the equation. So would I have to draw another equation for sodium oxalate? Because does the sodium even matter? Okay, so what are we doing here? Ice table, okay? So, Okay, initially, how much sodium do we have? I mean, not sodium, how much, sorry. So one of those calciums do we have? Okay, so we have 2.2, .2, zero. times 10 to the three molar. We don't have to worry about this because this is a solid. <clears throat> and okay, zero of So we have zero for the oxalate ion initially, okay. Okay. No, there doesn't necessarily have to be one that's losing it because now all of it is going to a solid, right? Okay, so. That's so bad, isn't it? Plus X, and then that's X. Okay. What was that? The KSP. Okay. And what about, so our KSP is going to be equal to this value? Okay. Okay, so then you're going to say KSP. Now, are you guys sure about this? KSP is going to equal 2.20 times 10 to the minus 3 plus x times x. Okay, so. Are you guys sure about this? 
because it says calculate the mass of sodium oxalate required to prevent coagulation of a 3.00 milliliter blood sample with 2.20 times 10 to the minus uh, three molar calcium ion and a KSP of calcium oxalate. So we would get number of moles. I mean, divided by, first we'd have to divide it by a thousand and then, okay. Um, so then that would give me number of moles of, so that's when we're trying to get our, get to our mass and stuff like that, right? So there's, we've got to think about this, right? This is a, it's a little tricky, right? So what's happening? What are we, so first off, what are we trying to do? So we're trying to add enough to stop coagulation, right? So we know that at equilibrium, we can actually calculate how much, we can calculate what we call the solubility of the, the uh, calcium oxalate, right? The maximum solubility. So K, KXP or the molar solubility, not maximum, molar solubility. KXP, KSP is the equilibrium solubility. If I want the molar solubility of Okay, that's right. We need to get to the point because that was the whole point of looking at the quotient, right? Yeah. So the quotient was, we want to try to get precipitate, right? So we want to try to get it so that it precipitates. So we want to drive the precipitation. And then if our KP, so if, if our Q is lower than KSP, we won't have a precipitate. We're trying to get it so that we have a precipitate, right? So we want we want the solid to form, right? We want only the solid. We don't want any of the because we know that coagulation happens because of that calcium. We want to get rid of the calcium. Does that make sense? Uh huh. No, 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 it's not the solid. So it says because blood is collected when, oh, sorry, collected blood samples will coagulate due to calcium ions present, right? So in other words, to keep that from happening, we want to get rid of the calcium ion. Well, how do we get rid of the calcium ions? By adding oxalate. And then we add enough oxalate, that's right. It causes it to go towards the solid so we form our precipitate. Does that make sense? And so we need to figure out how much of our oxalate we need to add, right? But the first thing is that we need to figure out at equilibrium, what would be the constant? I mean, what would be the, at equilibrium, what would be the concentration, the maximum amount of calcium that we would have, right? And then we need to take that into consideration when we do our, calculations for oxalate because we want to drive the equation back the other way. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's, there's a two-parter, right? The first thing is that we need to figure out 
what is that concentration at equilibrium? So what is the concentration at equilibrium of calcium? How would I figure that out? Okay, so let me put this on the side. I'm gonna erase this here, if you guys don't mind. It's the most roundabout question. They give you a lot of information to try to get you to think in the right way. So 1.96 times 10 to the minus eight. And we know that's gonna be equal to, at equilibrium, it's gonna be X, the concentration of calcium and the concentration of that. So it's just gonna be X squared, right? Because it's a one-to-one -one ratio, is that correct? Okay, so then if I take the square root of this, then that gives me X is equal to, Say it again. Times 10 to the minus one to the minus four. 1.1 1. 1 times, okay. Part of hearing, 1.4 times 10 to the minus four. Okay, so 1.4 times 10 to the minus four. And that would be our concentration of, of calcium, right? So right now we have 2.20 times 10 to the minus three molar of our calcium ion, right? So that's what we have. Wait. And then what we need to do is we need to get this value so it's lower than the 1.4 times 10 to the minus four, right? So our goal is to try to get it to that part, right? So how much, so once I get it to this part, right? That means that we're, that's, it's gonna be driving it the other way, right? So how much, how much, what is the minimal amount of oxalate, sodium oxalate that we can add that would, cause this to happen, right? So we wanna go from, so this would be our starting out. This is gonna be our equilibrium. How can I get it so that it drops down to that much, right? So how much sodium oxalate do I need to add to get it to go down to there? And again, we're talking about three mils. So how would I figure that out? No ideas? Say it again. Oh, we don't have to change it to moles. We don't have to change it to moles yet. That's what you're saying, moles, right? Okay, so we need to get it to this value, at least this value, right? So if we try to get it to that value, then it's 1.4 times 10 to the minus fourth. And we have 2.2 times 10 to the minus three, right? We just have to subtract them, right? So if we subtract these guys, but then that's gonna give me, that's gonna give me the number of moles. Oh, it's gonna give me the number of moles. Well, it's gonna give me the number, oh, it's gonna give me the, the molarity the molarity that I need to get rid of. That's right, then we use our three mils. Okay, so if we do that, what do we get? Oh my God. Does that make sense? It's, it's a, it, it, well, and it's also all over the fucking place, right? Makes it interesting though. Okay, so 
point zero six times 10 to the minus three molar. Okay, so now we know that that's, can I, can I raise this part down here? You guys okay with that? Yeah. Okay. 2.06 times 10 to the minus three molar, right? And we need to change this into, okay? So then we need to, I'm gonna erase this part here. We have three mils. So I've got three mils. Then I, then I go from mils, oops, thousand mils to one liter. And then I can use this value, that two point. <coughs> Maybe if it lets me. And we know that molarity is just moles over liters. So that's one liter down here. I'll just change this into moles. Okay. And then that gives me my number of moles. And so if we have sodium oxalate, what is the mass for sodium oxalate in A? C2O. Four. So sodium weighs 23.99, so 24. What was it 23? It was 22.99. Okay. 22 plus two carbons, so two times 12, plus four oxygen, so four times 16. So one eleven point zero zero eight. So we'll just say one eleven grams per mole. Okay. So then we'll go uh, one eleven gram per one mole. Of and a oh shit sorry it should be two so it's two times this is what happens when you do things half a week okay two c two o four so we'll add another twenty three to that so that's what. Okay, so what do you guys get?
times 10 to the minus four. So that's one, two, three, four. Yep. Yeah. So 8.28 times 10 to the minus four. Yeah. Okay. So that would be the minimal amount of oxalate that we could add. What's that? It is a little different, yeah. You guys are just in the habit of doing ice tables. That's what it was. Okay, everybody get this down. I'll give you guys a few seconds because it's, it's a lot. Yeah. So, and now that, that's that concept. So when we're looking at it, that Q value, right? Because that lets us know, in this case, we have so much calcium, right? So we need to get to the point so that we're sucking up that calcium. And then we know that this value here, that 1.3, that's gonna be our equilibrium, right? So when it gets to that point, that means that you're okay. So it's balanced out that you have. No, we did. That's the wrong way. Actually, no, you are correct. So technically we should have add more. So it should be a plus. So technically I'm wrong. So we should, this value here should be different. Good, good point. What was that? Yeah, so technically we should add more, right? Because if we got it just to that point, that means that we have, we, we have our calcium at that level, right? So what does that mean about the oxalate, right? We have to add excess. So we have to bring the equilibrium to go over it. So, so you guys are right. My bad. But this guy number, this number here should be three. Well, it's one point three. I mean, two point three four. So, you're right. Initially, it's that plus. Yeah, it's different, but yeah. So, so let, let me see if I can explain it a little more clear since now that I had time to really think about it. So the maximum solubility, right? That is the value where we get the precipitation we want. We're always gonna get a little bit of this, right? So like, at equilibrium, you're always gonna have a little bit that doesn't dissolve, right? Once you reach equilibrium, you're always gonna have that, right? Now, we know that the calcium cause coagulation, we wanna get to the point so that we get rid of all of the calcium, right? So even that little bit that dissolves, we wanna to try to drive it the other way, right? So if we have oxalate, that isn't comparable to that, right? Less than that, then it won't be able to drive the reaction, right? If it's comparable to that, it still won't be able to drive the reaction, 
Okay. And the way that we are calculating it first, we're saying, hey, we have oxalate enough to suck up all of the excess to that point where we're, we're getting that reaction to occur, but we don't get enough to get it over the hump. Okay. By adding it, it adding that additional amount, what we got at equilibrium, that gets it over the hump. It says, okay, we're getting the stuff that's there, and then we're driving it a little extra to get it over the hump. Yeah. So did you guys do, redo the calculation for me? It'll be pretty much, it should be close to. Nine point four four one. Something minus four. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So does that make sense? Can I raise? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I get it. I agree. It's just getting used to it. Okay, so pH effect on solubility. So the pH of a solution can affect the solubility. Um, so it can either cause it to be more or less soluble. So if we adjust the pH, it can precipitate uh, dissolved ions. And then if we, uh, or it can solubilize insoluble ions. Um, so if we have the magnesium ion can be purified by precipitating seawater with uh, the hydroxide ion from calcium hydroxide. So calculate the pH required for a calcium hydroxide solution to precipitate magnesium ion from seawater to obtain a 1.00 times 10 to the minus five uh, molarity of the magnesium ion concentration with a KSP of 8.9 times 10 to the minus 12.
Okay, so what is the equation that we're looking at? Mm -hmm. to precipitate. So calcium hydroxide, when it gets into a solution, it's going to dissolve, right? So calcium is just bringing it, bringing the hydroxide to the party. Mm -hmm. But calcium hydroxide can precipitate. I mean, uh, hydroxide can bind to magnesium and precipitate. Yeah, that's what they're saying. So the seawater has the magnesium ion. And so this is the reaction that we're looking at. So we're looking at the magnesium hydroxide. It's gonna give us a magnesium ion and hydroxide. There should be two of those, right? Okay, so this is gonna be very similar to the last problem. Only thing we have KSP is gonna equal 8.9 times 10 to the minus 12, which is gonna to equal to X times 2X squared, so then I get equals 4x cubed. So then x is going to equal 4. Yes. You're saying at, at equilibrium? So you're saying that, yeah, but so, but, okay, so how do I say this? Okay, so at equilibrium, right, we're gonna have so much magnesium, right? That's gonna be just in the ionic form. Okay, and initially, this is how much magnesium that we're gonna have from seawater in general, right? So what we're saying is that seawater has this much magnesium. We wanna get the water, the ions out of seawater entirely, right? So if we wanted to do that normally, all we would do is we would just add the comparable amount of this that I would get to make this happen, right? But the problem is, is that we have equilibrium. Even though that we get to equilibrium, we get this form, right? At equilibrium, we have a little bit of magnesium still left. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so first thing that we need to do is figure out at equilibrium, how much magnesium are we gonna have, right? That's gonna be free. Yeah, so in this case, we're trying to find that at equilibrium, how much magnesium ion are we gonna have? So did you guys get a value for that? Does that make sense? A little bit. What was that? Okay, 1.30 times 10 to the negative four. Okay, so that means at equilibrium, when we get to equilibrium, right? And that's equilibrium of the magnesium hydrox uh, hydroxide solution. So regardless of what happens at equilibrium, right? So as soon as we add enough of the magnesium hydroxide to it, we're gonna have this much extra magnesium ion. This is how much magnesium ion is gonna be left over, right? So we need to make sure that we add enough to collect all of this and the magnesium that we have in seawater, right? So we need to add it, yes, before we figure out how much, how much hydroxide we need to add, right? No. Yeah, yeah, okay, so let's see, let's see. Let me see if I can explain this a different way. Okay, I'm gonna, I, I think I have a way of doing it. Okay, give me, uh, give me a second to kind of get my thoughts uh, and also find a way of whiteboard. Okay. Can you guys see a whiteboard now? All right. Okay, so, and Abel, can you guys see the whiteboard or is there anything showing uh, yeah. up? Okay, so, okay. So if I add sodium, I mean, uh, sodium hydroxide, if I add calcium hydroxide to seawater, so what's gonna happen is that calcium is just causing the hydroxide to come here, right? Okay, now seawater has magnesium. Okay. And this is going to be a little exaggerated because I'm, I'm just trying to get the point across here, right? Okay, so what's going to happen is, is that, as we let it sit and it gets to equilibrium, we're going to get this happening. And we're gonna have a whole bunch of those forming, right? And then we're gonna have a few
that are going to stay in the ion, right? And it's not that they can't form, but it's just because what happens in that solution is that not all of them will precipitate, right? So that means that you still have magnesium in our solution. And that's our equilibrium constant, right? So you're not sucking up all of the magnesium. So we need to figure out a way of driving that reaction so that we suck up all of the magnesium, right? And so we need a, what we call a minimal amount of, of the hydroxide that we need to add to get that little bit of magnesium that just doesn't want to bind, right? You need to push it over that threshold. So there's this threshold level that allows me to have that minimum amount of magnesium that still exists. And so now we need to make sure that we add enough hydroxide to push it us over that threshold level, right? And so to calculate that minimum amount of magnesium that we're gonna have, even though you have precipitate forms, is by using that KSP. That's gonna give us our maximum molar solubility. Basically meaning that if you get to this point, right, you know, this is, you got total precipitation, what we believe to be total precipitation, you really don't have total precipitation. You actually have to go over that to get all of it precipitated out, okay? So we have to use that KSP to get to that point. And you guys, when we did that, that was our X times, 2x squared equal to our KSP, right? So that tells us that at equilibrium, this is how much that are still left over in the ionic form, right? That are still loose. You know, they haven't been tied down by hydroxide, okay? The wild, wild men or wild women, or however you want to look at them, right? Okay? So, what you need to do is you have to bring in some extra men so then that they finally find somebody that they can say, oh yeah, I'm hooked up, now we can, we can connect, right? You gotta bring extra to kind of get them to connect, okay? And so this lets us know how much extra we need to bring in, okay? So then that would give us a value, you guys, I can't remember what you guys told me. Three. 1.3, 1.3 times 10 to the minus four, okay? And then, uh, and that's molar, right? So, but we also have what we already had, right? Which is eight point what? No, no. 1.00 times 10 to the negative, you said negative one? Negative five, 10 to the negative five. So it'll give me 1.4. Huh, that's interesting. Okay, so. 1.4 1. 1. times 10 to the minus four. Okay, well, let's think about this, right? So if it's 10 to the negative five, was it 10 to the negative five? And we have 1.3 times 10 to the negative three, right? What does that mean? If we have less, if we have at equilibrium, we have less than what we actually have what do I need to do? Do I need to add anything or do I need to? I mean, I'm going to need to add something. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, this one is going to take a little bit more thought. Okay, so, so I'm saying. Okay, so this is the value that we have in sea salt. Right?
this is what would be left if we have precipitants, right? Okay. And so if we wanted to try to make sure that we got enough so that we get the precipitant, what would be left in this precipitant and what would be left in the sea salt, it would be adding the two together, right? Just to make sure that we get over, right? Okay. So we want to make sure that we have enough for this. This is a tenfold higher value than this, right? So I'm going to ask you a question. If I add this much plus this much, which you said it would be, if we add these two together, it would be what? 1.4 times 10 to the minus four molar, right? So, and that would be, oh, wait, okay. And then we know that it's, this is a one to two ratio of hydroxide, right? Is that true? One to two. So that means that we would have to add twice the amount of hydroxide to get to that, right? Times two, right? Okay, so now here's my thing, right? This value is lower than what we would have for our quantity for magnesium that would leave product, right? What was that? So right now, well, because since it's less than, it's not gonna favor the reactants, right? It's less than that value, right? So our Q value, Here's our, I mean, our Q value, our Q value right now, this value here, oh, I, I understand what you're trying to say. I understand what you're trying to say. So at this point, we're driving the reaction the other way, right? So we want to make sure that we're driving the reaction that way, right? That's what we want to do, because we want to get it so that it's all precipitate. So that's why we want to make sure that we have more than this value, because we want to drive it That's right, yeah. So our goal is to drive it in this direction, right? I'm gonna put a big O, and you can't see it because I know in that direction, right? We wanna go in the pink direction, right? So we wanna make sure that we're adding enough hydroxide to push it in that direction, right? So at equilibrium, we need to make sure that we we are at, at least above equilibrium to drive in that direction. And if, oh, you guys are back. Yeah. That's right, oops. Okay, so, if we are above this, we're gonna be driving it in the other direction, right? If we're at it, we're at equilibrium, okay? So we need to make sure that we have enough that we're driving it in the other direction and that we're not, and if we're at equilibrium, that means that we still have that available. Does that make sense? So that's the reason why we have to take, we have to calculate this, right? That 3.4, right? We calculate that first, and then we're adding on this to make sure that we're gonna be driving it so that we take over, yes, to take all out, the rest of it out, okay? So, but the other thing is that we have to take in consideration is that there's a two, a two to one ratio, right? So then we're gonna need twice the amount of this so then times two, so then that's what? 2.8 times 10 to the negative 
for molar. So if we calculate the pH of that, minus log, I mean, yeah. So, but this is, this is of hydroxide, right? So this would be, if we calculate the minus log of the hydroxide, that's gonna be pOH, right? So if I wanted to calculate the pH, what was that? 14 minus that, okay. So can you guys do that for me? So does that make a little more sense? Yeah, and, and just, uh-huh. So this part here, okay, so initially this number here pertains to the magnesium, the magnesium, right? The magnesium ion, yes. It's just a magnesium ion because that's what's going to be left in solution, right? Because even at equilibrium, because the solid is going to form, right? Solid's going to form because we have a, we know that the Ka is low. Yeah. So the solid is going to form, but you have these little guys that are hanging out. Okay. It's kind of like your hair, right? So I'm going to use you as an example, right? So if we put his hair in a, in a ponytail, right? He always has a couple of these hairs that just hang out regardless, right? Most of his hair is in the ponytail and solid, right? But he has those few hairs that are hanging out. So what we're trying to do is try to find a way of getting those hairs captured so that they're not just hanging out. So what we do is we have to add extra of something, right? So in that case, we're adding hydroxide to get that extra that can help drive it the other way. So in this case, we put cow lake or whatever we call, right? Jail, crazy glue or something, right? To get those extras to put in that ponytail, right? So that's what we're doing, okay? Does that make sense a little bit more? You like that one? Okay. Okay, so did you guys calculate the minus log of, so our P-O-H, is going to be 3.55. And then we subtract 14. So 14 minus 3.55. So that would be our pH. Yes, which we would assume because we have a weight. Yeah. Okay, is that making a little more sense? I know these are, they're a little tricky. They're not hard because you're like, man, there's just two things I have to look at. And then, but just trying to understand what's really happening, right? That's the, the the part that solubility. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay, so let me find out what side I'm on. Last side seven. Okay. <clears throat> so, selective precipitation. So, what do you guys think selective uh, precipitation means? Yeah, so we can basically, knowing what we know about solubility, we can pick out what we want out of a precipitate, right? So if you have a mixture of ions, if I know the solubility, I can sit there and figure out, okay, I can end up with just this guy or just this guy, okay? So many ions are, are either an acid or a base soluble. So it basically means that either they're gonna precipitate in an acid or they're gonna precipitate in a base. Okay, so for example, lead two and mercury two and silver ions are all insoluble under acidic conditions. So basically meaning that they won't dissolve in acidic conditions. 
Whereas um, iron three and chromium three, zinc and calcium are all uh, base insoluble. So we can take advantage of these variable solubilities to sit there and separate things in, in qualitative analysis. So if we're trying to identify, let's say we're doing a forensic analysis, and we know that you know, this area is very uh, iron rich, you know, and this area is very chromium rich. So you're trying to figure out this body was this body killed here or was it killed there, right? And so you can sit there and do an analysis to sit there and distinguish between you know, iron, I should say, to say iron and silver, right? You could use one analysis to sit there, put it under acidic conditions to see if that was present on the body, or you can do it uh, in the case of basic conditions to see whether or not it was in an iron rich environment, okay? <clears throat> okay, in the case of wastewater treatment. So we basically can uh, we'll treat a lot of wastewater and then we'll recycle it into various parts of our, our, uh, our system there, right? So it basically is gonna remove contaminants. We wanna adjust the pH. And then um, we want to say water with excess phosphate can result in ad algae buildup or growth of algae. And then if we're not careful, we could get growth of certain bacteria as well under those circumstances. Um, and so we want to try to remove the phosphate ion. And uh, so calcium hydroxide is going to be added to form calcium carbonate upon adjusting the pH. So the calcium carbonate reacts with the phosphate ion to precipitate out a solution as calcium phosphate hydroxide, okay, solid. Okay, so here is a, a, an example, although we have no calculations to do, but this is just basically an example. So by doing that adjustment, we could sit there and precipitate out that phosphate ion completely, okay? So in the case of the Lewitt acid base, so, <clears throat> so we've talked about bronstadt lori we've talked about Arrhenius, and so the Lewis acids and bases, which you guys are very familiar with, are gonna be defined slightly different. Okay, and this is going to be really important in organic chemistry, right, guys? Okay, so a Lewis acid will be accepting bonding electron pairs. Okay, so in other words, electrons from somewhere else is going to be going to them. They're going to be a Lewis acid. Okay, and then so a Lewis base is going to be the one that is going to be donating the electron pairs, okay? So let's see if we can kind of figure this out. So this is gonna result in uh, coordinating covalent bonds to create acid, an acid and base effect. So this happens in organic chemistry, left and right. <clears throat> okay, so here, our goal is to identify the reactants as a Lewis acid or a Lewis base. Okay, so the best way of doing this is by looking at the available lone pairs that could be donated. So if we have sulfur, I mean, uh, sulfur dioxide, so then that would be Okay, so how many valence electrons does sulfur have?
valence electrons. So electrons, valence electrons are electrons that are going to be involved in bonding, right? That's why. So it has six. So sulfur has six valence electrons. Oxygen has six valence electrons. That's another six, right? So we have a total of 18 valence electrons. So when we do a Lewis dot structures, we need to make sure that we have a total of 18 valence electrons. So that's two, that's four, that's six, that's eight, that's 10, that's 12, that's 14, that's 16. So I'm missing two on this. Alrighty. So let's do this. Where am I? Two, four, six, eight, eight. It's 18, are you sure? Did I? Yeah, each dot, no, each dot is one, the line is two. So that's, no, 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 because we're just looking at this guy, right? Because we're looking on the reactant side. We're trying to determine who's the, Resonant structure, resonant structure. Uh, let's see, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, right? So it's two games. What's that? Okay, well, let's, 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 resonant structure would be, let me, I'll show you an example for resonant structure, but let's get the structure right first. And I messed it up right now. So we said we have six valence electrons one, two, Three, four, five, six, right? Okay. And then we have six valence electrons on the oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then we have another one over here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So then, if we do this, so that's two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, and eight, right? Okay, so that's eight around here, eight around here, eight around here. Everybody's happy. So the resonance structure for this guy would be having the double bond on the other side. Okay. Was that? Yeah, yeah, you were right. So we've had the double bond over here and then, yeah. So, and then in the case of water is H2O, right? So it's H O O O. H. Okay, so now of these two, who's going to be donating electrons? Okay, so are you talking about the oxygens here or the oxygens here? What's that? Okay, I'm, I'm talking about, so, I'm talking about the, okay, let's see how do I say this. I'm talking about of these two. So we could have, because we have valence, we have lone pair electrons here, right? So those could be donated. We have lone pair electrons here. Those guys can be donated, right? And then, but we also know our product, right? So when you said our product is going to be S O. O and O with the double bond. And then this one is going to have H attached here. And this guy is going to have and then we're going to have this guy Okay, 
Okay, so we know that water, sorry, water is most likely going to be donating electrons. So who is going to be, because if we take a look, we have a hydroxide here, and then we have that H. So we have, what was that? Okay. So water is going to be our Lewis base. Yes, because it's the donating the electrons. So it's going to be donating its electrons, right? And so this guy is going to go and attach here, right? And then that's going to lead to, well, literally what you're going to have is Electrons here are going to be donated to that guy. It's going to cause this guy to be released. Then it's going to affect these bonds and it's going to take these bonds. And then that's going to be donated to the hydrogen, which is going to be released and added onto that. The other guy, right? It's, we'll get there. But first off, we just need to be able to identify who's going to be the base and who's going to be the acid, right? It's following the arrows. So that's going to be the base, and this is going to be the acid, Lewis acid. Okay. Okay. So here, who's going to be the base? Uh, who's going to be the base or the acid? So let's look at this guy, right? This is boron. Boron is this. First off, does it have any lone pairs to donate? Does it have any lone pair? No, it doesn't. So where are the lone pairs gonna come from? Okay, so this is gonna be my Lewis base and this is gonna be the Lewis acid. Not always, not always. We can't, we can't make that assumption. Okay, so here we have sodium, uh, cyanide. So in this case, we have Na. Na is going to be plus Cn. So that's, that's we know that cyanide is minus. So if I remember correctly, it should be C. Okay, this guy is gonna be minus. I'm sorry, my thoughts are not showing up so well. Okay, and I'm gonna give you a hint. Anytime that you typically have an ion, right, and it's negatively charged, chances are that's probably gonna be your, your donator, right? So this guy is gonna be my blue space. This guy is gonna be my blue acid. Okay, and here. You have that look, what do you guys think? What's gonna happen? This is an ionic compound, so what's gonna happen? Fe3 plus. Oops. Is this going to be our Lewis acid? But because you have Cl, this is just going to give you a bunch of Cl minuses, right? So that's dot, 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 dot. So this is my Lewis base, yeah. That's right. Because it's an ionic compound, when we put it in solution, it's going to be a Lewis base. So then this guy is going to be donating its electrons. The Cl is going to be donating its electrons to the water. So this is the Lewis acid. Okay. Does that help? Okay. Let's see. <clears throat> okay. So 
when we're forming, when we're forming complex ions, remember when we're supposed to do complex ions experiment, right? So when we're forming complex ions, that basically is going to involve donating those lone pairs. Okay. So the Lewis base reaction is going to involve a complex ion formation due to lone pair coordination covalent bonds. So the formation of a complex ion from a metal and a ligand can be written as an equilibrium equation with the equilibrium formation constant Ks. Ks value are usually large numbers indicating they favor shift to the products. An example of a complex ion equilibrium equation. So write the equation for the silver ion reacting with thiosulfate ion to produce thiosulfate silver uh, complex ion. Okay. So we have the silver ion. Silver ion is Ag, and it's one plus. Okay, and the thiosulfate ion and then that's going to make a G. S2, O3, minus. Okay. And it's an equilibrium. So it goes both ways. So if we write the equation, AQ. A Q, A Q. So then if we're doing our complex ion, our K at equilibrium, it's gonna equal what? How do I write the equilibrium concept for that? Products of reactants. Okay, so our product is Ag S2 S, I'm sorry, O3. Minus over a G plus over S two O three two minus. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> And then it says, if 100 mils, I mean 150.0 mils of 0 0.0001 times 10, wait, sorry, 0, 0 molar of silver nitrate is mixed with 200.00 mil of 5.00 molar sodium thiocyanate, calculate the equilibrium concentration of silver ion thiocyanate ion complex with a KEQ equal to 7.8 times 10 to the eight, 7.4 times 10 to the eight. <clears throat> okay, so how would I do that? Mm. <sighs> uh. 
how would I calculate the KEQ? So is there a precipitant for me? We have no precipitant for me. So don't don't get this don't don't get um, uh, don't get led down the wrong pathway just because we're working on we've done molar solubility. Think about everything that we've done at this point. So how would you normally find the equilibrium uh, solutions? What was that ice table, right? Okay, so if we do an ice table. No room for an ice table. Do you mind if I flip it to a, okay, so let's flip it to a whiteboard. Okay, let me add a page. Okay, so our equation was AG plus, plus, and we know that that was all aqueous. S2, O3, 2 minus, AQ. And that yields AG. S two O three two minus. Oops, sorry, you're right, minus. Okay, so if we do the ice table for this, we have. Zero point zero 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 one zero zero molar being added to this, right? But it was how much? Fifty mils? I mean, one hundred fifty mils. Okay. So we probably should change that to moles for right now, right? because we're adding them all together into a single solution. So if we do that, um, so we're gonna multiply this by the number of moles. So it's what, uh, I'm sorry, the number of liters. So it'll be 0 0.150 liters. <clears throat> and then that's gonna give me my number of moles. Five times ten to the negative one, two, three, four, five, right? And then we also have here for the vial sulfate, we have. 200 mils or 0.2 liters of a five molar okay so then that's going to be uh, 1.0 moles Okay, so then if we want the concentration, our initial concentration, because that's what we need to get it back into, we know that we have 200 
milliliters and 150 milliliters. So that's 350 milliliters or 0.35 milliliters. I mean, liters. My hand is so many different places. So 1.5, what was that? So it's, yeah, 350 mils total. So we need to divide both of these by that value now, right? So that's 1.5 e to the negative five divided by 0.35. So got to move our ice table down. So initially we have, what is that, 4 point, yeah, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because there is a possibility that I messed up, 4.29 times 10 to the one, two, three, four, five, 10 to the negative five. Five. Molar. And then for the divided by point three five. So that's two point eight five. Eight six molar. Okay, so that's going to be our starting ounce initially. <clears throat> All right. So, and then I have zero of this guy initially. All right. So the change is going to be negative x. Negative x and x. And then our equilibrium is going to be those values minus x. These values minus, minus x. And <clears throat> x. Okay, so then we're going to get KEQ going to equal. We had AG SO SO two. I'm sorry, S two O three minus over <laughs> the concentration of a G plus S two O three two minus and then we plug in our values we have K is going to equal 7.4 times 10 to the eighth power. It's going to equal um, X over 4.24, I mean, 29. times 10 to the minus five minus X. Thank you. 
I don't got the password for my guy. Okay. Time seven. Two point eight six minus X. So if we assume the five percent rule, then we just get X is going to equal to that value, right? It will be for all of the X's, right? Or the subtractions, right? In the denominator, yeah. <laughs> okay, so in this case, we'd probably have to use the quadratic equation, right, to get to what we want. Because there's no way that no, it wouldn't be x cubed. It'll be x squared. Okay, so let's just kind of leave it here, and then we would solve for x. Okay using the quadratic equation. Okay, one more slide. I can handle one more slide. No, no. I think we're gonna call it a night. We'll talk about the lab, the day of the lab. Okay, so in the case of multiple equilibriums, uh, so here is an example. So multiple uh, equilibrium, uh, sorry, multiple reactions can occur simultaneously. Um, and so we can write those as either A, sequential equilibriums, or they could kind of be written as simultaneous simultaneously as well too. So okay, so one important multiple equilibrium is carbon dioxide reacting with water to form carbonic um, to form uh, carbonic acid, okay? Um, and so in that case, so if we got, the formation of carbonic acid, that's going to be broken down into another reaction. And so we could end up with both of those reactions happening at the same time. So what, let me give you an example. Right. So let's say we have this is not working. Can you guys see the screen or did I stop sharing completely? Um, no, I can only see the whiteboard. I don't know if you're still. Okay. How about now? Can you see it now? Sorry about that. Yeah, now I can see it. Okay. So if we have. H2O. Plus. CO2. It's going to yield H2 CO3. Okay. <clears throat> so, but what happens to this guy is that this guy, carbo um, carbonic acid, isn't stable. It's going to form back into our water and CO2, right? So you get the formation of this, but it's gonna go back to this, right? So you're gonna get that double formation. So if you get the formation of the carbonic acid through other means, let's say two things are reacting, carbonate with something else to give you the formation of the carbonic acid, you're gonna get the formation of this, right? So 
these guys are in equilibrium, but in reality, what's happening is uh, is this. Did it again. It's okay. So it's an equilibrium. You're going to have these guys acting quote at equal rates, but you're going to have more of this being produced because this is in a stable moiety. Okay. Okay. So another example is the fluoride treatment. Uh, to prevent tooth decay. So in this case, we have sodium fluoride with um, uh, calcium uh, phosphate uh, hydroxide. And so we're gonna get the formation of calcium phosphate fluoride and hydroxide, okay? <clears throat> so, um, this is gonna basically, So this is gonna basically produce um, a floral uh, apathetic that's gonna be more resistant uh, to the reaction with lactic acid. Um, and so in the case of, let's say sugar, sugar's in your mouth, the bacteria are gonna basically build up. You're gonna get your lactic acid reacting with um, hydro, uh, Sorry, hydroxy uh, lactate. Uh, sorry, hydroxy lactate, which is uh, this guy, and then you're going to get the production of, or the breakdown of just your calcium ion, your phosphate ion, and then your uh, lactate and water. Okay, so this guy doesn't break down because we're, oh, sorry, wrong class. This guy isn't gonna break down because of the, class, uh, the fluoride. The fluoride binds it, keeps it intact, okay? And since the fluoride is gonna bind it and keep it intact, you're not gonna get this breakdown. But if you don't have that fluoride, this guy, which is what your tooth is, is happening with the tooth decay, it's going to be broken down by the lactic acid that is produced by bacteria, okay? And so as a result of that, you're gonna get all of these forming. And so this is considered a multiple equilibrium because you have this first event that's happening, and then you have the second event also happening, right? So anything that isn't occupied by this reaction is gonna be taking place by this reaction. Okay, questions, concerns, cash. Okay.